Okay, so, um, first cause CI 200, there must have been a first cause. This is from the um, Counter Creationism Handbook by Mark Isaac. And uh, he gives a quote from Henry Morris Every event has a cause, the universe itself had a beginning, so it must have had a first cause which must have been a creator god. And the third objection that uh, Isaac uh, raises to this, it says, uh, this claim raises the question of what caused God. If, as some claim, God does not need a cause, then by the same reasoning, neither does the universe. That's where we left off with part one. Uh, well, I think that uh, these kind of remarks uh, are very... Um, uh, th these kind of reservations are very common, uh, but very misguided. Um, I'm not sure how many times uh, we have to point this out, uh, but the universe, the, the uh, g God, as he says, does not need a cause. But then he goes on and he says, well, uh, by the same reasoning, neither does the universe. Well, why that's false and misguided is because the universe, well, as Henry, as Henry Morris said, it had a beginning. Um, when something uh, like God doesn't have a beginning, uh, when something is eternal, when, when a being is eternal, then that being is a necessary being. Uh, there's no time at which the being is not, uh, so the being always is. Uh, well, well, I suppose you could have an eternal being that's not necessary, but but God, God's essence is to exist. He cannot not exist. Uh, but the universe is a conti is contingent. Uh, the universe, we know it's contingent because it had a beginning. Uh, so, therefore, there was a time when it was not. So it does not have to be. The universe can not be. Uh, so the universe is fundamentally different from God. Uh, the universe... Uh, let's go back to that. Uh, let's see the exact wording he used here. It says, God does not need a cause because he's eternal. Then, by the same reasoning, neither does the universe. But this ignores the fact that the universe had a beginning. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the the universe, just as it is, need not be just as it is. But it is. Uh, so this calls for some kind of cause, which God does not call for. Uh, God is eternal. God has to be the way he is because he is essentially uh, a necessary being. The universe is essentially a contingent being. Uh, therefore by definition of the word contingent, the universe has to have a cause. Uh, so this uh, totally uh, misunderstands uh, the argument, the, the uh, first cause argument. All right, moving on. The anthropic principle, CI301, the very next question, and this is the only other one I want to look at, uh, it says the cosmos is fine-tuned to permit human life. The cosmos is fine-tuned to permit human life. If any of several fundamental constants were only slightly different, life would be impossible. Uh, this claim is also known as the weak anthropic pr uh, principle, H. Ross, 1994. Uh, so the first one, Henry Morris. The second one, Hugh Ross. Now, Hugh Ross is not a young earth creationist like Henry Morris. Uh, he is a progressive creationist. And I would commend his site to you. I think it's reasons to believe dot org. Um, at any rate, it says the. And by the way, uh, he's really the only creationist uh, that I'm aware of who, uh, who I can think of right offhand, who actually keeps up to date uh, with the current scientific research uh, in young earth creationist publications. Uh, it's common to see. Uh, some you know study from 1960 or something that they're appealing to uh, to prove their points, uh, but Hugh actually uh, goes on to read all the different journals that are coming out each month. Well, maybe not all of them, but 
he tries to keep up to date uh, with science, with nature, uh, those those journals with that title, Science and Nature, and uh, and so on. All right, so uh, the criticisms of the weak anthropic principle says, number one, the claim assumes life in its present form is a given. It applies not to life, but to life only as we know it. The same outcome results if life is fine-tuned to the cosmos. We do not know what fundamental conditions would rule out any possibility of any of any life. For all we know, there might be intelligent beings in another universe arguing that if fundamental constants were only slightly different than the absence of free quarks uh, and the extreme weakness of gravity would make life impossible. Indeed, many examples of fine-tuning are evidence that life is fine-tuned to the cosmos, not vice versa. This is exactly what evolution proposes. Well, uh, this first response uh, totally misunderstands what the argument is. The, the, the argument is not that life as we know it uh, is impossible unless we have this fine-tuning. The argument is that life period is impossible unless we have this fine-tuning. Uh, for example, if uh, the, the uh, gravitation if gravitation is too weak, if, if it's even a little bit weaker than in fact it is in our universe, uh, the uh, expansion of the universe would be so extreme that there wouldn't be any planets. Uh, there wouldn't be anything other than, than just space, uh, empty space. Uh, so uh, there can't be any kind of life uh, any kind of biological life in that kind of an environment. If it was a little bit stronger than it is, uh, the universe wouldn't expand at all. It would remain a singularity. Um, and then he says that um, many examples of fine-tuning are evidence that life is fine-tuned to the cosmos, not vice versa. This is exactly what evolution proposes. We couldn't even have evolution unless of the fine-tuning because life would be impossible in principle. Uh, th there would be no way for evolution or whatever preceded evolution to get life from non-life. Th there would be no way for those things to be in place uh, because the universe was not finely tuned enough to permit for those things to get started. And, yeah, life does have to conform to the environment that it finds itself in. So in that sense you could say that life is fine-tuned to the, to the universe. But life itself is absolutely impossible unless uh, we first have the fine-tuning. Alright, uh, number two, if the universe is fine-tuned for life, why is life such an extremely rare part of it? Uh, that's an interesting question, but totally irrelevant. Uh, number three, many fine-tuning claims are based on numbers being the, quote, same order of magnitude, unquote, but this phrase gets stretched beyond its original meaning to buttress design arguments. Sometimes number more than one thousand-fold different are called the same order of magnitude. Clay 2002, how fine is fine anyway? That question can only be answered by a human judgment call, which reduces or removes objective value from the anthropic principle argument. Uh, well, I'm um, not sure if I totally follow everything he's saying there, but the idea of how fine is fine, uh, you can actually put numbers on this. Uh, it's just very, very uh, slightly different. Um, and I'm not sure what the numbers are, but uh, you, you, you can quantify this. And uh, I think Leslie, Leslie, somebody, I forget now who, who it was, but he went through and, and, and figured this out. And, and the, the analogy that, that William Lane Craig uses is uh, if you have a piece of paper, uh, the, the life-permitting values of the constants would, f if you have every possible value of the constants, um, representing a different 
world, in a multiverse, the life-permitting universes are a fraction, a fraction of the life-unpermitting ones. So he uses blue dots and red dots, and the red dots are surrounded by, by blue dots. The, the, the blue dots are life-unpermitting universes, uh, and, and, and this is all quantitative. Um, so it is very fine indeed. Okay, uh, there's a few more objections to go. We'll have to save that for part three at the conclusion. Thank you.